see a few more participants joining in. All right, so the way um, we do these Zoom meetings usually is everybody's mic is muted except the uh, presenter. Uh, these meetings are recorded, so we can then we'll post these to our Design Safe website uh, for future materials. So if you guys ever need to go back to it, feel free to go back to the slides or uh, back to the content. Uh, anything, any of the demo software we use or any of the, uh, the, uh, the data we use or the notebooks we create, we'll post those to our website as well. Um, if you have any questions using uh, a, towards one of us, there is a chat window available. Uh, one of us has already figured out what that chat window is. So all you have to do is go up to the top menu. There is a, uh, a button that says chat on it. If you click on chat, you can ask questions. Uh, we have some taxers, some people here at TAC online right now willing to, uh, to ask uh, to answer your questions. <clears throat> also, there's a Slack channel. <clears throat> you may have received an invitation to that Slack channel already. Uh, feel free to hit that Slack channel and we will uh, do, there will be a topic on there for today's webinar. And if you have any questions after the Zoom session is over, feel free to go there and we'll continue the conversation. All right, uh, then we'll get ready here momentarily. So I'd like to welcome everybody to, uh, this is gonna be our last webinar uh, of the year for Design Safe. Uh, this one we're, the last few, we've decided to go ahead and do some focusing on the specific applications that Design Safe uh, engineers, Design Safe researchers use. Uh, so I'd like to welcome you all. Um, I'm located here at the University of Texas at the Texas Advanced Computing Center. So uh, coming to you live and direct from Austin, Texas. Uh, I'd like to give you a little bit of background about what Design Safe is about. I know we have some people online who are new, and I want to discuss what Design Safe is used for, uh, what the different components of Design Safe are, and then we'll introduce a couple of the applications that we have available to you on Design Safe, some of which are scientific visualization apps. And then these apps you can then use uh, to upload your own data and do your own, uh, your own, inter your own visualization. All right, so uh, getting started here. So what is Design Safe? Well, Design Safe is part of a vision, all right? Our vision is that we want to create a cyber infrastructure. A cyber infrastructure is basically a, uh, a collection of resources, uh, computational resources available to a user or to a scientist. Uh, what we want to do is this, we want this infrastructure to be part of your research discovery and we want it to be an integral and a dynamic part of your, your research discovery. Uh, we want this to be the go-to place where you will go to upload your data, uh, analyze your data, visualize your data, uh, then be able to see what the story is behind the data. I mean, that's really why we're collecting the data in the first place, is to understand what the story is behind it. Uh, and we want this to, and Design Safe is going to support your end-to-end -end research cycle. So everything from conception to publication, to collaboration, to, con to conception of new ideas, to collaborating on new ideas, and then publication, publishing these new ideas that start the cycle over again. Uh, and every step of the way, there are tools on Design Safe available to, uh, to allow you to basically do this research uh, uh, a, lot, a lot better, a lot faster, and become more productive. Uh, so we want to enhance, amplify, and link all the capabilities, all the NERI components. Now, so Design Safe is built to support the natural hazards community. You know, we're talking about the earthquake, earthquake researchers, storm surge, uh, hurricanes, and wind. So we're bringing all these guys under one umbrella and that one, and link all these NERI components together. So the way that Design Safe is built is we have a, we have the main hub of it, which is the data depot. Uh, the data depot is essentially a environment for all for you to load your data in. And we will support everything from the simulation research to experimental research to the rapid research. Uh, you guys collecting your data, collecting your sensor data, 
collecting your simulation data, collecting your reconnaissance data, put all that stuff together into the data depot, where then we provide you a, a list of tools. Some, some of them we've already created for you and collected for you. Some of these tools are going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, some of these tools are gonna to be the tools that you'd like to write, uh, the tools that you create, scripts that you'd like to use. And with all that, being able to take that new data set, curate it, and then publish it. So let me give you guys a quick walkthrough on Design Safe on the slides, and then we'll actually take a look at the site itself. <clears throat> so Design Safe is built around uh, the research workbench. That is basically where all of your research can take place. Uh, the research workbench is, uh, entails the data depot, your workspace, a portal for the recon, and then creation guidelines, and then uh, a place where you can get support. So first thing we want to look at is the research workbench. All right, so the research workbench is, uh, like I said, that is the hub of it. You can go to it either way. You can go to it from the menu, or if you scroll down the web page, uh, you can find a little section of it as well. The first place we're going to hit, which is like what I said, it's kind of the heart of uh, Design Safe, is the data depot. All right, so the data depot is a place where essentially we host the life cycle uh, for your data, where you can discover, publish, share, upload, download, collaborate. All right, all the pieces to it. It's kind of, it's what we kind of think of it as is a data repository. It acts just like a file system. So you can upload your files. Your, your data can be really in any uh, format. The, the format is totally up to you. What kind of, uh, how you want the data to be formatted, how you want the data to be uh, presented. That's totally up to you. We don't want to uh, pinhole you, pigeonhole you into a particular method of uh, working with your data. So it works just like a uh, file manager would. Um, it is set up, if you look at it, it's viewed just like a file manager. Every, when you first log into Design Safe, we, we create a, a section of Design Safe called My Data, which is essentially just like a file manager. You create folders, you create files, you can upload files, uh, you can share files with other people, uh, you can then copy your files into projects, copy your files into, uh, into community data. When, you pub when your data gets published, then we move it from, or actually we don't move, we, we copy it from its current state into the published data realm. And of course, if you notice, we do hook up to some popular cloud uh, providers as well. We have box.com and dropbox.com currently, uh, with others uh, currently in development. So your my data, that's the place for you to save your files. It's from your scripts to your data that you create, uh, to reports, to photographs, everything you essentially, everything you need to do your research you can put in here and then you can um, you can uh, manage it however you're most comfortable with so underneath my data we have a place called my projects now my projects is fairly new to design safe uh, and the idea is this is a collaboration space so you go to my projects uh, you create a project folder you add in who the primary investigator for that project is, you add in other uh, co-PIs to that project, you add project collaborators, and essentially this is a, a workspace for you and your team to develop, uh, to curate, to understand what this data means. Uh, you, can put in, you can put in some Jupyter Notebooks, which we'll talk about here in a bit, and uh, once you're ready for this data to be published, you essentially say, all right, the data is set and we want to publish it. It essentially freezes that data or that project in place. So you can always make additional changes later and then republish a new uh, publication or a new data publication with, without actually uh, messing up with the old one. So the links all work and they flow, they flow the way they should. There's also a section called shared with me. So what shared with me is for, this is a part where uh, Any time you want to share a file with another Design Safe user, and is not going to be something as uh, as big as a project, so a single file or a single file with a bunch of other people you want to share with or show them ideas, and not be as uh, as formal as a project. This is where you would essentially set this up. Uh, these are currently files which are shared with me. If you have a file you wish to share, you just kind of go to the shared icon, select the file, click share, add in the users you want to add, add to or share with and give them the proper permissions you'd like to share with it. 
Next, uh, what we have is we have something called published data. Uh, box.com, Dropbox.com are, are pretty self-explanatory, works the same way. Published data is any data set that is currently hosted on DesignSafe that has been published and therefore publicly available. All right, uh, so again, because it's publicly available, you don't necessarily have to have a DesignSafe account to use it. You can access these data sets uh, just by going to the website and, and access them anonymously. Uh, and it gives you full searchability, so you can search for anything from uh, a particular PI's name or to a particular topic or subject matter that you, know, you wish to find data on. And then once you find the data set you're looking for, you can then um, you can click it yourself through, find whatever it is you need, and then download that to your local machine. Or uh, create, a, create a design safe account, and then instead of downloading to your local machine, just copy it into your local My Data, and then keep everything based on the cloud. Now the newest member of uh, the Data Depot that we have is Community Data. All right, Community Data is also publicly available data. Uh, these aren't formally published, unlike the published data. Community data is essentially a uh, showcase. It's a showcase of notebooks, it's a showcase of data sets, it's a showcase of, of scripts, of photographs, of research work that you would like to, you, you believe could be beneficial to the rest of the community and therefore want to share it with the rest of the community. Everything within the community data is read-only, so you cannot actually accidentally modify or change any data. Uh, if there, there is a readme available, if you wish to move a file into the community data network, uh, we allow you, there is a path for that. You just contact somebody here at TAC and we'll, we'll help you with that. And basically, it's, it's a showcase. So if I, have, if I created a notebook, a training notebook, or a data set that I wish uh, for everybody to work with. In fact, Dave's data set will be moved to the community data so you guys can work with that there. You can download, and once again, you can download it, you can copy it into your own data, your own my data set, and manipulate it, use it, and, uh, and, and search through it. All right, um, the next thing is, now that we can, you can load your data into DesignSafe, you kind of need, we have to, we've given you some applications to actually uh, analyze the data with or uh, visualize the data with. Or uh, you can, and we gave you, we've given you a bunch of tools which are a lot of popular open source simulation codes like OpenSeas or AdSerp or OpenFoam. Uh, but then we also have some commercial uh, applications available like MATLAB. And then we have some, some new ones like a HazMapper, which maps hazard areas around. Uh, and then uh, GeoClause available there as well. Plus, we've given you Jupyter Notebooks, and we've given you some visualization tools, which uh, Dave Sarmero will introduce you to. Okay, so when you go into the, the, the Discovery Workspace, the first thing you see is a tray of applications. This is your application tray. This is uh, the applications currently available to you on DesignSafe. Uh, each of the applications has a little bit of documentation with it. So if you click on it, you can read through the documentation. Uh, it gives you things like an input directory, an output directory, what um, any, if there's any tickle files that you wish to run, you can install those there. And the way this application works, and the way DesignSafe works in general. So DesignSafe is a cloud-based application. All right, we've given you a website, to a, which is a portal to a bunch of cloud resources. So behind the scenes, we have a lot of the resources we have available here at TAC. TAC, you know, we're a supercomputing center. Uh, so what, essentially what you're doing is when you're launching an application, it is uh, creating a, it's making a call through an API and then getting an app queued up to run. So when you have an OpenSeas application and you put your input directory, you uh, install your tickle files and output and all that stuff, and you're ready to go and you click run, it queues up this job to be ran on the resource, and you'll get a notification in DesignSafe saying, hey, your resource is getting, is, uh, getting set to run, so it'll go into pending. Uh, there's actually a job status available. You can go in there and see what your job's, current job status is. Once it goes through pending, it's gonna go into run mode. Uh, once it's finished running and your, da your data set is now available for you to view, it will come up with uh, another notification saying, hey, your run is complete, and then you can go to your output folder and uh, view your data set. One of the apps we have available is MATLAB. Uh, MATLAB is kind of cool. It runs 
in a web environment. Uh, it is a what we call a, a VNC session, basically. It runs in a desktop environment on the web. And essentially, you give them the same things. You give it a how long you want you believe you need MATLAB for, how long will your job run. You give it a name. Uh, you select different, you select an output location if you have anything outputting, and essentially hit run and it will queue up your job. So here, you know, I submit a job and it queues it up. It says, hey, your job submitted successfully. And when it's ready to run, it'll tell you, hey, your interactive session started. All you gotta do is click connect and it launches it into a, uh, a VNC session. So on the website, you can then get to your, your MATLAB and all your design safe files map to your, uh, to your design, your MATLAB version, so all your files are there. Anything, any scripts that you've created or any scripts that you've uploaded are going to be available for you. And then the big thing that we have uh, available to you on Design Safe is an environment or an IDE uh, called Jupyter. Uh, Jupyter is a great program, a, a great interface for creating. Uh, what we have available for right now is just Python and R and some bash scripting. It's a great environment created for you to do some actual programming in. It also maps to community data, it also maps to the published data, and it maps to your project data and your local data. Uh, so you can write scripts to manipulate your data in, uh, in, various, in various languages, uh, Python and R are currently available, and in various locations. So if it's, a project, if it's a project you're collaborating on, something you're doing locally, if it's uh, one of the publicly versioned data sets that we have that you wish to query, you can do all this through Jupyter. So on the application tray, if you scroll over, uh, Jupyter is available to you, click on Jupyter, and then you click on Launch. Uh, launch will come up with a new window, uh, a new tab in uh, on, on your internet browser, and it'll come up with a button that says start my server. Actually, I think it also asks you to log in, so if you log in, it'll take your login information from Design Safe and pull it up. So the way Jupyter works is you log in to the main screen, you click you know, start my server. What it does in the background is it launches a virtual machine for you. Uh, once that virtual machine gets launched, I, I hope I had a script there, a screen for shot at that, but I don't. Once your, your uh, Jupyter session gets launched, you can then um, install any files you need. There is a terminal window available for you, so you can uh, do a PIP2 a PIP install for Python 2, and anything you install will go into user space. Now, mind you, this is a little different than running, some of you are very used to Jupyter already. This is very different than running Jupyter locally. Uh, when you run stuff locally, you have access to your local machine, uh, any any installs you make or any uh, uh, modules you in, you you bring in uh, are uh, static on the machine. They'll stay there until you delete them. On Jupyter, you, they're being loaded onto a virtual machine. Uh, once essentially, once you log out of Jupyter, all those uh, files that you imported in or any libraries you imported in are going to disappear until the next time you bring your uh, Jupyter server back up, you have to reinstall those. So they're, they, they, they're not permanent. All right, so a little bit about Jupyter Notebooks and then maybe I'll give you guys a quick tour of one. Uh, so Jupyter Notebooks are, like I said, they're, it's a web-based interactive computing tool, all right? Uh, and it's developed for the entire computation process. You do your development, you do your documenting, your, your uh, ex execution code, everything runs in Jupyter. Uh, and it's a way of, of building these parts, sharing with other people, and people can look at bits and pieces of your code, uh, and it's broken up into cells. And the way each cell is managed, you essentially put each cell with the same kind of, uh, uh, actually we talked about this already, how the interface works, same, so each cell is essentially a particular part of your program, and you kind of want to uh, keep your cells together. So this is kind of what Jupyter environment looks like. When you launch it in, you'll see publicly available data. Uh, you'll also see a place for community data. You'll also see a place for uh, your projects. Uh, but when you, but the my data location is where you need to go. So when you first launch log into Jupyter, it is very important that you actually click into my data or bring in one of the public data if you want to look at those. Because if anything you do in the root directory will not stay and will disappear uh, 
you know, it, there's, there's no permanence there. Anything you do in my data is going to permanently stay because it gets saved into your local data, uh, your local file system available to you on Design Safe. <clears throat> so Design Safe, the way notebooks are structured, uh, they're structured in two ways. You have code cells and you have markdown cells. All right, markdown cells are essentially built for uh, for documenting for document uh, documenting your code. Uh, it's and it's, it's markdown so a, a popular markup language like HTML. It'll take just fine. Your code cells are pretty uh, self-explanatory. That's where, where you enter your code. In your markdown cells, you can add headings by using the hashtag. Uh, or the pound sign, whichever you wish to call it. I'm older, so I call them pound signs. Uh, put a pound, space, and whatever heading you want, and it'll automatically update it for you. You can add lists, uh, ordered lists or unordered lists. Uh, you can put, like I said earlier, you can put pure HTML in there, and you can even do latex, which is kind of cool. Just put the dollar sign, put your latex uh, format in there, and it'll automatically give you what the equations. Um, the way notebooks work, um, it's, so you work on your program, the way the, the cells are structured, I mentioned this a little bit, is you will take, take a computational problem and you will break it, you'll organize it into related ideas. So each code cell uh, will either be one entire if block or one entire for loop or, uh, or whatnot, or bits and pieces of your code where you do all your initialization or you set up your boundary conditions or whatnot. Uh, read in your data sets, do your installs or your imports, and just keep those separate. And then between each code cell, I like to suggest that you put in your, um, your, your markdown cells where you actually describe what's going on. Um, and how will you actually organize this? Well, I suggest, and this is what I always tell people, is uh, let a, what a lab notebook be your guide. So the way that, uh, my father used to be a, is an aerospace engineer, and so he used to work in a, a, a experimental lab while he was in college. And in the wind tunnel, he would you know put different uh, he, he would put different shapes, different models inside the wind tunnel, set up different uh, settings for the experiment to run, and then execute it. And the way it would work is he'd execute the run. The idea was all right. Now that I did this experiment, I could take to my lab notebook hand it off to somebody else, and then somebody else can then take that lab notebook and replicate my work. Uh, Jupyter notebooks are the exact same ideas, except now we're looking at the computation side of things, or we're looking at the data analysis side of things. The idea being now I could take this notebook that I created, hand it off to somebody, and somebody could run my notebook and view the data the same way I viewed it, or look at the, uh, the visualizations the same, the same way I created it. And then the other way I look at this too is, it is almost as uh, could be an interactive research paper. I'll show one of the uh, one of the documents we have sitting in the community folder is an actual research paper that is interactive. We can go and look at different sensors. Uh, you can look at different uh, uh, sensor readings and look at the different visualizations that get created. And some people have gone and put animation in there, and you can actually animate, you know, like a, a shaker table with a, a model sitting on top of it. And so you can make it, basically make them as big as you want. Split up notebooks when they uh, get too long, and you know, essentially, whatever makes sense to you as a user. That this is something I want to share with somebody else, and I think somebody else can learn from it, or I'm going to share it with the rest of the people on my team. It's the best way of looking at it. All right, um, these are some shortcuts available. I'm going to keep these slides open to you because they come in very handy. Easier shortcut is to run a cell, hit Shift Enter, uh, and then it'll run that cell, and then insert a new line. Uh, and insert a new cell underneath, all right? <clears throat> Control enter lets a cell run in place. It essentially does not create a new cell for it. It just leaves it there. Uh, honestly, those are the two I use the most, is control enter and shift enter to run a cell. Uh, Alt enter and then escape to go between command mode and edit mode. Uh, and um, before I introduce Dave, I was actually going to do a quick demo on, uh, on Jupyter Notebooks. So I already have one set up here. And so when you look, click on Jupyter under work, Research Workbench, you just click on Launch. This will bring up a login button. So I'm going to go ahead and click Login. I'm going to use my credentials here. And we come up, you'll see uh, more than likely see a My Server or Start My Server. I do suggest you see a Stop My Server. If you did not log out of your previous session, you can still go to it that way. 
If you click stop, it'll go ahead and halt all your notebooks and uh, reset your environment for next time. I do suggest uh, every time you exit out of Design Safe or exit out of Jupyter, do go ahead and log out and close off your running tasks. So I'm gonna go back to my server here. So here's your, our landing screen in Jupyter, all right? So we'll see um, the folders you're most interested in would be community, my data, projects, and public, all right? Projects are, like I said, public is the publicly available data sets we have on, on Design Safe that you can navigate to and use inside of your code. The other thing I suggest doing is a lot of people point, uh, a lot of people uh, will import in a data file and they'll use HTTPS to do an import. Uh, I will suggest actually giving a path to the file, to the, uh, if, if the file or the data set resides on Jupyter, I would suggest actually going to that path uh, uh, using relative link to go to the path and pulling it in. And I'll show you how to get that. All right, so if you click on my data, uh, this is the same my data from the data depot. So everything is mapped here uh, exactly as it was before. Uh, these are some of the notebooks I have available. I'm going to go ahead and um, pull in one of these, like the intro to contour plotting with R. And if you can see, here's a bunch of uh, markdown cells that I have. Here's a little bit of code cell. I'm reading in a table, a data table that's actually sitting in the community data table. Uh, I'm pulling it in. I'm viewing it. And then I'm doing some, uh, just a, a standard contour map of it. You know, I think this is a sample of a heat equation that I have in here. And then you can look at it. You can look at it in different ways too. We can look at it in, uh, as a contour map. We can also look at it in a wireframe, uh, or we could change the colors around and, you know, just zoom out a little bit and see what things look like. Um, and it's kind of neat to look at. And notebooks, like I said, it's a great way of creating code, great way of sharing code, and uh, allow you to collaborate with other users and sit look at data sets. Next thing I want to show you before I hand this off to Dave is under Jupyter, there's also a terminal window. So if you click on terminal, this will bring up a terminal window to your virtual machine that Jupyter spun up or Jupyter Hub spun up for you. Uh, and of course, it's just a regular Unix environment. You can do LS that takes looks at where everything is. You can change to my data. And this is uh, how you should import your data in. Actually, what I'm gonna do is, um, if you do PWD, of course, it shows you that directory. If you uh, go into a particular data set, this is essentially the path, the relative path that you want to use. Notice a couple things. First off, I'm logged in as Charlie, but on my VM, my username is Jupyter, which is why I suggest pulling in what the, uh, what the actual path is here. This is a little path here. So I would just copy and paste that into your Jupyter notebook to do your import of your files. Uh, also mapped to this environment is the uh, community data. So community data, like I said, this is place for everybody who wants to uh, showcase their data set or showcase their notebook or their project and allow the rest of the Design Safe community uh, to be able to learn from it. Uh, we use this as a lot of the training stuff. So inside the Jupyter Notebooks directory, uh, you'll see some training notebooks. Am I, oh, I some Design Safe training notebooks, my bad, sorry. Design Safe training notebooks, and you'll see a bunch of directories with some Design Safe, uh, some training notebooks that we've created through in past webinars that you can then come here and view. There's also uh, some, um, there's also a few little bits here that allow you to, uh, as we, as questions get asked in our Slack channel, and then uh, some of us will do research how something should work or how things work better, uh, we might create little snippets of example notebooks, and we will put those here. Like uh, one of the questions came up in a recent Slack channel discussion was, hey, how do I view PDF files? Uh, and with a little bit of research, we came out with a really great solution for you or a really clean solution for you, and we published a notebook in the community called Viewing PDF Files. And uh, actually, if you're interested in seeing that, it's a little bit of a code. Jupyter Notebooks, Design Safe Training Notebooks, viewing PDF files, and here's a little sample of how it works. Yeah, and, and so yes, essentially, it's just an easy, easy little bit of code, create a class, and all you gotta do is send it the document you wish to view. <clears throat> and so we'll put little snippets of code like that inside the community data folder. 
<clears throat> of course, if there's any questions, feel free to contact me. Uh, I'm on the Slack channel. I'm Charlie on the Slack channel. Um, I monitor the Jupiter channel there. I monitor the training channel there. And I'll monitor the new webinar channel that we'll create for this particular webinar after, uh, after uh, we close out our Zoom session. Okay. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce Dave Semerero. He is a research associate here at TAC. He's uh, part of the Scalable Visualization Technologies. And uh, he's been doing, doing viz for quite some time. He's very knowledgeable at it. And he's also on the Design Safe project. And two of the applications we have available to you on Design Safe, let me show you these, is we have Visit and Paraview. Uh, and Dave's going to, they work very, very well hand in hand. So Dave's going to be talking about a data set that he has. Uh, come across in his research and what how exactly you can import that into pair review and uh, do your scientific viz on it. Okay, uh, with that, Dave, I'm going to hand this off to you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and copy your data file in there for you so people can follow along if they wish. And uh, everyone, uh, Dave Sermero. Uh, okay, I have. <clears throat> Adjusted the uh, microphone, I think, on my end. Um, is it less uh, less loud than it was before? Can you hear me? No? Yes? I can't I, hear you, Charlie. I can oh, hear you. We can hear you, okay. You can? Yeah. Oh, when, uh, Jack says it's still loud. Um, I will, I will speak softly. <laughs> I, I cut the I cut the volume in half. Oh, better now. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Excellent. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about two aspects today. I'm going to show you how Paraview works. And Paraview is is one of the uh, scalable visualization tools that we have available for you through Design Safe. Uh, it's also available outside of Design Safe. Um, uh, just on the TAC equipment. Um, and it's an open source uh, parallel visualization toolkit. So uh, you are free to uh, navigate to pairview.org and download that. Um, there are, uh, you don't have to do it right now, um, but uh, if you're interested, there are uh, binary uh, executables for Linux, uh, Windows, and Mac, as well as all the so uh, source code if you, if you feel like, um, you know, wading through the source someday and uh, possibly uh, compiling it for yourself and doing some experiments that way. Um, uh, we use Pairview and we also use Visit. Okay, so both of these codes do essentially the same thing. And they're, uh, as a matter of fact, they're based on the same code base. The code base that they're based on is a library called VTK, which is, uh, stands for the Visualization Toolkit. Uh, VTK had its beginnings at uh, General Electric in Schenectady, New York, but now the people who developed it have um, uh, forked off a company called Kitware. Now, Kitware uh, is the source for many good software products. Um, Pairview uh, is from Kitware. Kitware also makes the CMake um, uh, software build um, environment. Uh, framework uh, that you may have come across if you're doing any, any programming in C or C++. Uh, CMake is is your friend because it, it's sort of like a layer on top of MATLAB. There's also VTK, of course, the original uh, visualization toolkit. There's ITK, which is an imaging uh, toolkit, um, and uh, several other software projects. Uh, there's they they had a, uh, a volume visualization uh, application also that they put out. Uh, uh, Visit is uh, a similar parallel application, parallel Viz application that grew from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. It is also based on the visualization toolkit for the rendering and, and uh, wrangling of the, the graphics primitives. Um, but it, it took a slightly different, um, a slightly different course. Uh, the two, as you might imagine, the two toolkits are designed to do the same thing, right? So. Uh, if you uh, if you if you set out to do the same thing, two different teams set out to do the same thing, you're going to um, reach a very similar conclusion, right? Uh, the major difference between these two uh, applications is one of them 
is, uh, is basically in the user interface, right? So the user interface looks a little different, but it still has the same sort of idea behind it. So we'll look at Paraview um, as, as a, an exemplar of these, these types of uh, large scale parallel uh, environments. And we'll also, we're also gonna look at um, um, uh, some Python notebook stuff. Now, what, what I use um, Python notebooks for is uh, data transformation, okay? One of the, the main things that a viz scientist does is they get data from a scientist and they have to figure out, uh, if they're lucky, the data is readable by Paraview or Visit. If they're unlucky, they'll have to, um, and we almost always are, we have to translate that data into something that Paraview or Visit will understand, okay? So that we're going to, uh, and, and usually in the past, before I started using Python notebooks, this, this process was one of writing some Python code to quickly transform the data to get it into Paraview so I could do something with it. Um, then the, the code would sit and languish and I would look at it and think, well, what, what does this code do? With Python notebooks, I can annotate as I go and uh, build up, uh, as Charlie said, build up the code in pieces, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, thereby have some provenance uh, to be able to look back at that project and look back at the code and say, ah, okay, uh, this is how I did it before. Um, may, and also maybe I can use uh, pieces of this code in, uh, in different projects. Anyway, it's kind of like using the notebook for, for development. So let's see, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, I'm gonna share my desktop, I suppose. Um, and uh, share desktop, yes. There I go, okay, so I guess you can all uh, see my desktop now. Let me see if I can pull up uh, Design Safe. We, uh, we can see the Design Safe stuff. Not yes, Charlie, if you can see the Design Safe stuff. Okay, we're good, okay, so. Um, uh, we start off, uh, I'm going to start off by talking about the Python stuff. We're going to trace through the Python uh, uh, notebook, the Jupyter notebook work, and then we're going to end up uh, with um, uh, working on, on visit. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go to, uh, what I've already done is I've jumped to um, the, the data depot section. Now you don't have to, you don't have to follow me along because you won't be able to because this is my section of the data depot, right? So inside my section of data depot, I've got a project called Seismic, okay? So I'm gonna go into that folder. Now the Seismic project, we have some people here that do seismic experiments. And uh, by that, I mean they have, uh, they have a truck with a, with a device that uh, sends seismic waves into the ground and they lay out geophones in a particular pattern and they, uh, the geophones are, are accelerated by these waves that travel under the ground. And from the geophone readings, they can try to um, uh, discern what the structure uh, of, of the soil is or what the state of uh, the ground is underneath the surface, right? So this is, um, this is a common practice in, in the uh, oil and gas industry. Uh, and and uh, now um, some other other geologists uh, are just they're just interested interested in, in investigating the rock structure beneath the surface are also using this technique. So um, anyway, um, we have uh, I've got some data from these guys, and basically it's geophone data. So let's see, and that's uh, that's what I stashed in this raw data file. Okay. So if we look in the raw data directory, uh, it will show us what the raw data looks like. So we can look at one of these files and it's, um, they're text files. So this is an example of sort of what we call flat files that people are, are um, uh, give that often, often people give us these type of files. Okay, so file preview, let's have a look. Show me something good. Uh, should be data in there. 
Ah, there it is. Okay, so this is what it looks like on the inside. Okay, so you've got some, some header, right? Uh, bits of header, and you have um, columns of data. Oftentimes you'll get columns of data, right? So uh, each column, I'm told, and I learned this by talking to the scientists, each, each column of data is, is for a particular uh, geophone receiver, okay? And these are the, the scalar values over time. Time uh, increases from the top of the column to the bottom. So each row of the, uh, of the data corresponds to a particular instant in time. And these are the time instances here. You can see it goes uh, from, uh, these are in seconds. Uh, it goes from negative to positive eventually. There are quite a few time steps here. I mean, the, the, the temporal resolution is fairly fine, okay? So, so um, uh, each column corresponds to a geophone, and the ge geophones are laid out in a particular pattern. Uh, so we have enough data to figure out what the, what the acceleration, so these are this, the units here I think are vertical uh, velocity, right? So positive is, is up and negative is down. And so as you get a wave that uh, traverses this geophone, it's accelerated in the vertical direction, and, and, and you can tell by how much uh, from this table, right? So, uh, so now we have the, the acceleration over time for a particular geophone. What we need next is where, uh, what, where is that geophone located in, re in relation to all the others? Then we have enough information uh, to plot the, um, the, the data uh, on the grid over time, okay? So the way uh, I found out where the, uh, the uh, geophones are located was, again, talking to the scientists, and they, uh, they supplied me with an Excel spreadsheet with a whole bunch of information. Part of that information was uh, the location of the geophones. So I have all this information. Now I have to transform it into some form that um, Paraview uh, will understand, okay? So Paraview, uh, as we'll see in a little bit, understands a lot of uh, very many um, data formats, okay? Uh, this um, particular one is not one of those because it's sort of a custom, uh, custom text file, you know, that, that was particular to this particular scientist and his particular project. So we're going to have to write a, pro, a Python program that will read that data from that table in, uh, use the other information that I have from the Excel spreadsheet uh, to describe the time history of these geophone uh, data uh, to, um, to Paraview. Uh, so the file format that we're going to use to do that is called a VTK file format. And we're going to create a series of files and put the data in a rect what's called a rectilinear grid, okay? Um, so in order to do that, we're gonna take advantage of our Python notebook. Um, and let's see here. In order to do that, I already have a Python session started. So, we can see here a Jupyter Notebook uh, session is already, has already been started. So let's see. Okay, so here's the, here's the root of um, my um, Python session that I've started in the seismic area. You can see that I have a, a, a progressive data notebook uh, and it's already running. Um, so let's see, let's jump to that notebook. Okay, so here's the notebook that I, that I wrote, okay. Um, so uh, this is my approach for, for when I do these things, okay. So uh, when I create a notebook, I initially give a, a, at least a little bit of description of the data that I'm going to be investigating. Um, what the uh, what the conversion what I'm doing with the notebook, which is, is converting the seismic data, as you can see there, and a little note to what I call notes to future Dave. So when I come back in the future, 
as my future self and look at this previous uh, snapshot in time, I can remember w what it was that I was doing. So um, you can see the notebook as, you know, is made up of cells. This is a markup cell that I've used. And here's um, uh, successive bunches of, of uh, code cells that build up the entire program. Okay, and in the end, I, I like to collect up all the code cells into a, a one standalone working program and then be able to execute just that cell to do what I need to do uh, to the data. So uh, another handy thing that I like to do with my uh, notebooks is I stuff the markdown cheat sheet right into, uh, right into the notebook. Okay, so here you can see this is just an example of common markdown that, um, that I might use. This is the, the printed or the, this is the converted version, right? So if I double click on this, here's the raw markdown itself. So I can see, ah, if I want a table, for example, uh, this is a table format, right? So that way I don't have to go hunting around on the, on the web uh, trying to find uh, where that full sheet uh, of, of markdown is. Although I do have the link here to where I uh, where I grabbed the markdown uh, from, so if I hit Shift and Enter, that'll convert that cell back to the actual processed markdown stuff. Okay, so that's how that's how I use these things. So let's just go through this one, and you can kind of uh, get a feel for what my thought processes were. Okay, so first I just tell you know what's going on. Okay, I'm, I've got this seismic data, I got some raw seismic data, I'm gonna convert it into a, a VTK file that pair of you can rock, okay? So, um, and this describes how, I'm, how the layout is, right? So I don't look at the layout and go, what? what? What's the logic of that? This just sort of reminds me what, I was what I'm trying to do. So let's talk about the raw input first. It's always good to, you know, uh, talk about the raw input and, and uh, write down what my impressions were and remind myself um, how I approach the problem. So, so uh, the first thing you do is you look at some of the, you look at the text file and um, uh, the text file tells you a lot of stuff, right? So you can see from the text file that like the first eight lines of the, of the file are just telling me uh, what the data layout is. And I don't have to, I don't have to read those. In fact, when I'm reading the data, I need to skip over that stuff. Right. And so that's uh, this this little bit just kind of recreates those first eight lines or so of the data and uh, tells me, uh, reminding myself that I don't have to read that stuff. The other bit is um, I, I kind of uh, I like to um, remind myself what the data structure is. OK, so in here I, I've noted that there were that there are 72 channels uh, in this in this experiment, right? So each channel corresponds to either um, a, a geophone or the accelerating signal itself, which is the, the hammer thing that they pound on the ground with to generate the uh, to generate the waves, or some other uh, accelerometers that they place to um, to instrument their uh, experiment. Okay, so. Of those 72 channels that, is, that are collected and that are in the data, there's actually only uh, 63 uh, geophones, and those geophones are arranged in a nine by seven array, right? So there's rows of nine, seven rows of nine geophones um, uh, laid out, okay? Uh, and I also note that this, the physical location here is given by a separate Excel spreadsheet that came along with the data. Okay, so the location, the uh, X and Y location of the rows and columns of the geophones is noted in that data. Now that data is just, is, um, uh, is never going to change. So it's hard coded into the, uh, into the converter for me, okay? This is for a particular experiment. So those geophones aren't going, aren't going to move. Uh, the other bit that I've noted here is that I've already got a, um, a bit of Python code that I used in another project that writes rectilinear grid files. So um, I've gone ahead and, and, and put it inside the markdown and used one of the, one of the markdown um, tags to, uh, to have it print, uh, to make it look like code, right? To uh, distinguish it from the rest of the text and preserve the indentation, et cetera. 
Um, so the, uh, this, is, this is what I'm going to reuse. This is a bit of code that I'm going to reuse, right? So it needs the X, Y, and Z locations of each point, and it needs the scalar values of those points, and it needs a file specification um, to, uh, uh, to use as an output file. So given that data, it will write a, um, uh, a VTK formatted rectilinear grid file uh, with this particular uh, file specification, okay? So um, the, the rectilinear grid file has a particular format. It's got a, it's, it's got a header, it's got uh, some other uh, string um, uh, delineated information and it's got the uh, it's got the the scalar data also. So this is here for um, uh, so that I know which which I/O code I'm using. And then this this uh, final note here just writes the the file format to uh, to the VTK format. Paraview and Visit, for that matter, can both read that. Okay. Okay. Next, we got to we uh, we got to start coding eventually, right? So the easiest bit. Uh, is to toss our I/O routine definition into a code block and uh, and um, execute it. Right. So we're going to do that. And and once we execute this, this this uh, function will be defined for further use down the down the road. Okay. So once we do that, we go ahead. We execute that. That's for later on. We're going to use that function call, but from not right now. Uh, the first thing we we'll want to do is to see if we can figure out how to how to uh, open the data. Okay, uh, so to do that, um, we're uh, we're going to open the data file, and the first thing we're going to do is the the, heart, the 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 rub there is trying to get the file spec right. So you notice that the Python notebook file is in the sub is in the seismic. Um, uh, directory, right? So I know where the, um, so that's going to be sort of the root uh, directory. Uh, file specs are going to be in relationship to, to that directory, and I know where the, I know where in relation to seismic all the other data is, and I also know where I want it to go, right? So this is, uh, um, I, I've specified the in file directory as raw data, because you remember when we looked at the seismic data, there was a um, a folder called raw data and inside that it had the, the three text files. So the data uh, raw data is the source. The out file directory is just is just called um, I'm calling it viz data here. And the file name uh, is I've just selected um, from those three files that we had this uh, AV or axsv uh, 130.txt. Okay, so with that, those three bits of information, I can construct a file name, and then I can try opening it. So if I run this little bit of, of code by hitting you know shift and enter, and I don't get any errors, that means okay, uh, uh, the the file has been opened, and we're uh, we're in luck. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so remember I mentioned that Excel spreadsheet that had that uh, that had some of that that uh, location data in it. Well, um, I went into that spreadsheet and I just extracted the numbers, the x and y locations of the data, and the z location is zero. Okay, so all this the geophones are on a flat surface, um, but the x and y locations of the rows and columns are here. So here's the nine. Uh, X locations, the nine Y locations, and we're just sitting, setting up um, an X, Y, and Z, X, Y, and Z vectors of data to um, to push to the uh, to the to the file writer. Right, the file writer needs these three vectors to uh, in order to write the data to the VTK file. So again, that's um, that's something you just uh, you, you run that. And these uh, uh, that that cell and these x, y, and z uh, files or vectors uh, exist. Okay. All right. Now I have I've got an open uh, file of scalars, and I have um, the uh, the the location vectors, uh, but I haven't read the scalars yet. I still need to read that data the um, uh, and put it into um, put it into the right grid 
orientation, right? So uh, reading the data, it's ASCII data, right? So it's just, it's just lines of text, essentially, uh, to, uh, to Python. So we can just do an f.read and get um, uh, um, a data handle, okay? So which is, that's what we did here. We read the, the entire file uh, from beginning to end, including the, the eight uh, lines that we, that we should skip, and we'll skip those later. Uh, next, we break the data into into very into separate lines, right? So we're gonna, and then we're going to deal with each line separately, right? So we we now have a list of in Python a list of lines that we will um, that we will process. How many lines we calculate uh, through this line count? And we just get the length of that of that um, list. And then uh, we calculate the range of lines that we want to operate on is going to be um, from line eight through line count, okay? And then as just a sanity check, uh, when we execute this um, piece of code, it'll, put, it'll print out uh, the number of lines uh, that, we're going to, that we're going to read or the number of lines that are in the file. So you can see this file has uh, 2,056 lines, okay? And remember each line uh, corresponds to one instance in time. Uh, Pairview handles time-dependent um, time data by um, uh, each by by considering each instance as a separate file. Uh, that's the easiest way to handle it. So the files are uh, uh, the file names are consecutively numbered. Right, so you got uh, uh, seismic zero through seismic uh, 2,055. So what this code is going to ultimately do to do the whole, to be able to scan the whole uh, series of time uh, data is it's going to it's going to create 2,000 files, which is 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 quite a few, um, not not totally unheard of. Each individual file isn't going to be terribly large. Uh, it'll only have 63, you know, uh, scalar values in it, but there's going to be a lot of files. Okay, so uh, moving on, we know that the each we need to process each line. Now that we have a, a list of lines, we need to actually loop through that list, process each line, convert each uh, uh, text value into its equivalent floating point number. And then, uh, and then stick that into the NumPy array, right? So um, we uh, we go we go through uh, all the lines in line range, and we crack out for each line. Uh, we split out um, all the words as a separate list. Okay, the list is tab uh, separated, so um, we split on the tab uh, the tab character. And that gives us a list of of, uh, of words that we then need to convert to floating point numbers, and we do that by looping through all the all the words on a line. Okay, uh, remember the time um, was in word zero, right? So that was the first column. So that's that's the timestamp. Okay. Uh, then uh, what we want to do is convert those. Um, uh, the 63 words that we have, because we know that there are 63 geophones, uh, into an, a NumPy array. So we set up this vector uh, that is just the, the words that are in that line and give it a, a data type of, of float, because we've already converted into floating point uh, numbers here. Then uh, the next thing we want to do is take that line and reshape it into a um, uh, the right size of the of, of array, so we reshape it uh, into a seven by nine array, and and tell uh, tell Python that we're or NumPy that this is a, a, F, a Fortran ordering, so it's ordered by columns. Okay. Then once we have that, we have all the information we need for a particular time step. We have the mesh, which is the scalar values. We have the x, y, and z values uh, of that of the location of those geophones, 
and we have uh, left to create a file name for that uh, for that data. So we do that by uh, um, creating a, a file uh, with a um, with a number right in it. Remember, we had to have numbered so consecutively numbered files. Well. Uh, we're looping for i in line range. If you remember, line range starts with the eighth uh, position. So what we're going to do here is we're going to concatenate the output file directory with this string uh, file percent zero four b dot vtk, and that's going to be the file name. Uh, the percent zero four b is going to have a four digit number that's going to be represented by I minus eight. So the first time through, um, uh, it'll be, it'll create file zero, but the, the zero will be, will have four, four places. So it'll be zero, 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 zero. Uh, Cause we need, you know, we need four digits to, to represent our 2058 files or whatever it was. Then the last step is to um, uh, go ahead and write that particular file, right? So um, when we execute uh, after the file is written, uh, after actually all 2058 files are written, um, we, uh, we have the, uh, the, the code will print run complete. So, okay. This sort of completes the process of um, stepping through and generating the code, okay? And remember, as we've added code cells, these are just uh, steps in the process. We execute them as we go along, and the state that they generate is used in the next cell. Okay, so this cell, once we execute this one, uh, it'll, it will run through all the data and generate the 2058 files and put them in, the out, uh, in this out file directory, which we've specified above. When it's done, it'll write run complete to the, uh, to the output. I've run this and it takes, um, it takes uh, a couple of minutes. It doesn't, it's not an extraordinary long amount of time, but 2000 files take, takes, takes a little bit to run. Uh, it runs and it completes and it generates all that data. Okay. When I reach this point, uh, and I'm satisfied that the that the that the um, that the notebook executes correctly. What I like to do is collect up all the pieces in one last cell, and that's what I've done here. So that in the future, if I want to change things, if I want to run something different, I can just I can come down to this cell and change like the, the you know the file name of the text file or what have you, and then just run this particular cell. And it'll do uh, it'll do what I want it to do. So you can see I've collected all the other cells above and placed them uh, in here. Um, one other thing that I've done is um, uh, now that we've generated the data, it, it, we can uh, look at it with uh, with ParaView. Uh, so when I initially tried to do that, um, I found. Uh, the way um, the way that uh, the way that Design Safe works is it sets up your um, your run, uh, but it also has to transfer your data to where your uh, to where ParaView is going to run. It sets up the run for you, uh, but then it transfers the data over to ParaView. Two thousand fifty eight files takes a fair amount of time to uh, to transfer a longer longer time than than we're willing to sit here and, and stare at the screen while it does it so what I've done is I've changed um, my uh, notebook just a little bit uh, to start at instance 500 and end at uh, instance 600 so it takes a hundred or uh, yeah basically a uh, hundred um, time steps out of the data from somewhere in the middle of the data and then just writes out 100 files rather than uh, 2,000. And I found that by doing that, um, the launch of the ParaView session was smoother and, and didn't take uh, a large amount of time. So let's go back to, uh, where was I? 
uh, here. Right, so um, here's the raw data. And here's the output. I also changed the, um, the name of the uh, output directory to VTK data. So if I look into the directory in the VTK data, there should be some data there. Uh, and it's not. Okay, well, surprise, guess what? Let's go over here and and uh, since we have the notebook, we can run it. Let's go ahead and run that cell. And it appears that run completed. So let me go back to here, VTK data. And there it is, okay. Validation, uh, you can see that all the files are there, all 100 plus of them. There should be 100 and, well, zero to 99, that's right. There you go, 100 files. It's nice, okay. All right, so that's the, that's how I, I use, um, that's how I often use the, the, um, the Python notebook stuff. Now I'm no expert at Python notebooks. I mean, there's probably easier ways to do some of the stuff that I, uh, did or there's more sophisticated ways to get at it, but um, uh, this this uh, saves me a lot of work. It, it helps me remember what I did, which um, which as I get older is becoming more of a problem, um, uh, and keeps me out of trouble. Okay, so let's let's talk about let's talk about Paraview. Let's see if we can start a Paraview session. Workspace, go to the workspace. There we go. And apps is gonna, gonna load here. We'll select an app and I'll show you how to now uh, look at that data with, with Paraview. Okay, so here's all our apps and here's Paraview. So I'm gonna select Paraview. And here's the script that lets us run uh, Paraview. So we need to do some things. We need to select a working directory. So I'm gonna go over here. I'm gonna go into Seismic. And I'm gonna get, what was it, VTK data, right? We're gonna, we're gonna select that directory, okay? And I'm going to select my desktop resolution. We'll call it, we'll give it the full resolution. Uh, now I have to give it a, a, a runtime, a job runtime. I like to, um, uh, depending on what I'm doing, the maximum job runtime is, is four hours. Okay, so this, this you specify in hours, minutes, and seconds. And depending on what I'm, what I'm uh, doing, I like to, um, uh, if I, if I'm just doing a quick check, I don't like to allocate more time than I need, right? Because, um, somebody's paying for this, right? So, uh, I, I like to only use as much resource as I need. So for this, I'm just going to, um, uh, set up a 20 minute, uh, session here and that will work. 20 minutes, and then I'm going to give it a job name, uh, DS, seismic. design safe seismic, how's that, that sounds good. Then I'm going to leave this, uh, it, it'll generate an output, um, uh, job output for the archive, and I'm just going to leave it at the default here. So I've got all my data input. Um, or all my all my form filled out here, so we should uh, uh, click run and see what happens. So it says I'm submitting. It's submitting my job. Okay, that's good. Job submission. So what this is doing is it's submitting the job 
to uh, attack resource, okay? Our resources have to be uh, allocated in a fair way. So we use a batch system to allocate those resources. Uh, the nice thing about Design Safe is you don't have to know how that works. It, uh, it does all that, it, it creates all that goodness for you, right? I mean, uh, there are, there are um, forms that need to be, um, there, there are uh, sbatch um, files that are batch files basically that need to be created and submitted. And um, uh, Design Safe is in the process of doing that now. Um, it's usually a little bit faster than this, but it's submitting my job. Ah, there we go. Job submit failed. Your job submission failed with the following message. Unexpected error. Please try again. All right. Well, let's give it another shot. Uh, everything's still filled out the correct way, right? Looks right. This is a directory, yes. The directory exists, yes. 1920 by 1080, 20 minutes. We'll give it another try. Ah, there we go. My interactive session has started, okay. I just wanted to make sure that I really, really wanted to use Paraview. So let's connect, and if we're in luck, Ah, look at that. Okay, so this is the Paraview graphical user interface. Okay, so now the Paraview portion of our program is about to begin. Okay, so um, uh, Design Safe has graciously started up this session for us, and uh, it's on the session's running on a compute node of our Maverick visualization cluster. Which, is, uh, which has 20 cores per node, um, oh, uh, a whole mess of memory. Um, but the, the, the neat bit is, is this is a, this is a batch allocated system, right? Uh, if you wanted to, to, to do this by hand, uh, there's a lot of hoops you have to go through. And Design Safe has uh, automated that whole process. So what has happened here is we've requested a node on the Maverick system, the node has been given to us, We've started a, a VNC session, a remote desktop session on that node, uh, and we have give, been given a secure connection to that desktop session. All that process, uh, if you were to do it by hand, would take um, would, would take some uh, would take some knowledge and take some doing. You know, people do it, but the beautiful thing about uh, about the Design Safe system is that you don't even have to know that that's going on. I mean, you just you just get your resource and you get your uh, your allocation and away you go. So I better use this before I um, run out of my 20 minutes. So uh, this is the, the visit um, uh, user interface. The image will appear here in this sort of blue gray area. Up here we have our uh, the usual control bar uh, that you're you know, familiar with with uh, most applications. You can file, edit, view, Sources are a little bit different. Filters are a little bit different. We'll get into those in a minute. So what we want to do is we want to open up that file. So we do file, open, and look at that. See that there? That's our files. Isn't that great? They're all there. They've been transferred to, to, um, to Maverick for us. That's another process that we would have had to do by hand ourselves uh, through SCP or FTP, what have you. Uh, to get our data onto that onto that system. So thank you once again, Design Safe. So I am going to select this entire collection of files because it, it represents a time history of what we're looking at. And then I'm going to accept that selection. Okay. So nothing happened. Well, nothing happened because uh, the way a pair of you works is uh, you make some selections and then you have to click apply before anything will happen. Right. So what 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 really did happen is there there was um, uh, Paraview read the uh, some metadata about the file. Uh, so then when I click apply, it'll go ahead and read the data in. Okay. So here's here is a um, color map representation of that seismic data. Okay. 
Um, now remember, there were 100 time steps, right? So if I, if I click the play button on the VCR, you can see the time steps. You can see the pressure um, uh, or the, um, the vertical velocity uh, as it's mapped uh, on the ground, you can see it over time, you can see it move. So you can see these waves move through the data. Uh, and the, the large red spot here is, is, I think, for this experiment, where they had the, um, the, the truck pounding on the ground to make the waves go. Okay, so uh, that's uh, kind of interesting, but you know, we can probably make it, oops, here we go, wait a minute, let me zoom back in. So what I just did there was I switched the view from 2D to 3D. So now we're looking straight down the, the Z axis on the surface. So I can tilt the surface around and that's all great, but it's still, when I push play, it's still just, you know, it just changes the color, which is great. I mean, it gives you some idea of what's going on, but we can use the tools that, that Pairview gives us um, in a, uh, to extract sort of more information about this. And, and for this particular application, I use the, um, uh, a filter called, uh, let's see, uh, what's it called? Alphabetical, that's yeah, called warp by scalar. So let's see, these are all the transformations that you can apply to the data. So we're gonna warp this surface by the scalar value. So that means we're just going to displace the surface by the, um, the amount, by the size of the scalar. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead and uh, set some stuff here. Let's see, what do we got? That looks good. Scale factor, let's go to scale factor of 10 because the, the vectors aren't very large. And we will click apply. And there, you can see that it's slightly it is slightly bent. The data has been warped a little bit by the scalar. Now, if we hit play, you can see the little waves. You can see the waves bouncing up and down. Um, let's make it a little, exaggerate a little bit. And uh, uh, I will go into a little bit more deal of exactly what I'm doing here. Um, oops, I forgot to apply. And there we go. Now, now the, the bumps are a little bit bigger and we can hit play and you can see the you know you can see the the uh the data uh the ground shake i guess and those are sort of exaggerated displacements of of, of how that particular uh acceleration looks okay so okay so the point of this whole exercise was to show you how you go from raw data to processed data that one of the visualization applications can use and then go into uh, into pair view itself, all staying in the design safe environment. Okay, um, I haven't any in, uh, I haven't installed anything but a browser on my on my uh, laptop. I can get at this data from anywhere in the world, and I can do a lot of a lot of interesting processing. Uh, also, okay, so I'm going to take the time that we have left, and I'm going to do a more uh, formal um, uh, step through of, of pair view, okay? But I'm not gonna do it in the, uh, in, in the, um, uh, in the environment, uh, in a design safe environment. I have pair view installed on my local system uh, with a data set that has been made available to you through, uh, through, design, through the design safe um, uh, community uh, data. I'm not sure exactly where where that was put uh, or how we how we uh, advertise where that data set is. Charlie, I don't know if you want to jump in and give information about where that data set is or uh, um, or what. Let's see. We'll probably publish that data set after uh, the webinar is over. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Um, that sounds good. So I think what I'll do here is I'm just going to, to uh, hide my browser and pull up uh, pull up the pair view session. Okay. So um, this is my local version of pair view on operating on my on my Windows laptop, and this is a, a binary um, you know precompiled binary that you can grab from uh, 
anywhere you like uh, from the pairview.org uh, website. So uh, what you see here is, is something that I've, I've already uh, sort of pulled up the data, um, but in order to, to show you how it works, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, do a reset on my session, which clears out the data, clears out all the other processes that I, that I had going. Okay, let's take a closer look uh, at the uh, Paraview um, uh, interface itself. Okay, so again, here we have the, uh, you know, the usual tab pull down sorts of things. Uh, some of them are specialized sources and filters. I'll get into what those are in a minute. Uh, these are iconic representations of what those, uh, what those things are. Um, some of these are not active at the moment because I don't have any data uh, loaded. Uh, this is the, the VCR uh, controls. So if you've got uh, time series data, you can um, uh, play that data. Or even if you've animated certain aspects of your um, of this of the scalar data, like you can animate uh, a slice plane moving through your data back and forth. Um, these are the controls that control that. This is a properties panel, and this um, uh, tells you what the properties of the particular uh, item that you uh, have highlighted are. Again, this is the uh, this is your your visualization uh, window, and this is a control for animation. Okay, so we won't be we won't be really messing with the animation uh, for this particular example, uh, so we won't get we won't be getting into that. But you saw the um, the uh, uh, the animation uh, worked when I had time series data by, uh, from the previous example. Okay, so let's let's go ahead and, and open a file. We go to file, and then uh, uh, maybe it's in recent files. Ah, yeah, uh, there it is. Okay, so. Uh, I can either do the regular open, or I can, or I can look at some recent stuff that I've looked at, and and I'm going to look at this recent file, which is the file. This so this is the data that you folks are uh, going to have access to through DesignSafe, and you'll be able to open it with um, Pairview on DesignSafe. Also, it works very well. So um, I've selected the data set, and what's happened is Pairview has gone ahead and read us uh, the header for the data and gotten some. Uh, some information. So here in the properties panel, you can see these are all the variables that are present inside that data. So we're going to want to go ahead and select them all. The default is only to select a certain few, but we're going to read all of those. We're going to uh, use them all, but at the moment we're going to uh, we're, we're going to read them. Okay. So if I when I click apply, the data the data uh, gets read. Okay. So this is um, a representation of the data. Now you'll notice that some of these uh, some of these other icons have become active now that we actually have data to look at. Okay, it doesn't look um, it doesn't look like much at the moment, but if I click on it and move it around, you can see that it's some sort of cylindrical object. Um, uh, and that this I'm doing just with the left uh, mouse button. And you know uh, the trackball, I can move in and out uh, uh, and do regular displacements and rotations. So uh, this isn't isn't particularly attractive to look at. Uh, so what we're going to do, the reason is that is that um, these controls here uh, that I'm pointing at apply to whatever I have selected. And since there's only one thing here, it's the data set itself. This is um, this is how we're uh, coloring the data and this is how we're representing the data so let's let's change the coloring first so we have something more interesting to look at um, we can uh, we can look at solid color which is what we've got here or we can look at any of the variables so we can color this by any of the variables so I'm going to color it by pressure okay much more interesting okay so this is the pressure uh, represented on this on this vessel. Okay, so I guess it's some sort of pressure vessel. I have no idea, you know, what this. Uh, this is a, just some example data from the from Paraview. Uh, you can see that we've got a um, a legend here that maps color to actual pressure values. So there doesn't appear to be a really big range 
uh, in value between of pressure, but you can see that there's a red high pressure zone and the blue uh, low pressure zone. So that's kind of interesting. So what else can we do? I mean, we can, we can color it by uh, temperature. Uh, okay, uh, hot inside, cold outside. Okay, that appears to be what's going on there. Um, so let's go back to pressure. Uh, we're looking at the surface, right? So we can, we can do, what else can we do? Um, we can represent that as a surface with edges. Ah, now uh, things are starting to make more sense. Now we have, now we can see that there's, that this is some sort of a grid or finite element model. And you can see the edges of the blocks uh, and the finite elements, ooh, that's kind of an interesting mesh down there, um, that were used to create, oh yeah, create this, uh, this experiment, okay. Um, if we wish, we can also just go to a straight wireframe, in which case you can see right through it, but the exterior is, is shown in this wireframe. So let's go back to, uh, let's go back to surface. That's pretty good, okay. Um, what can we do now with this? So we've got this data and we've changed the, the look of it. Well, um, we, can, uh, we can apply uh, filters to the data. So you can think of a filter as taking the, the upstream information in, transforming it in some way, and passing out uh, some other information. So um, a popular filter uh, that, that gets used a lot in, in visualization is the idea of an isosurface or a three-dimensional contour. So we can go up here to filters, and this is, this is, well, here's a alphabetical list of all the filters that we can apply to the data. And you can see that there are quite a few. Now, some of them, um, some of the filters are grayed out, which means that the data is of a, such a nature that those filters cannot be applied, right? So certain things can only be applied to, to um, uh, data of a certain kind, okay? So, uh, for example, if you if you only have scalar data or one value at, per point, and there's no vector data, or there's no velocity data, uh, you can't do uh, stream tracers or streamlines unless you have vector data, right? So um, this is kind of a handy way of looking at uh, everything at once. And then uh, Paraview breaks it down into more manageable pieces uh, by selecting some subsets of those filters and, and making them handy. So for example, here's the common filters. You have uh, uh, a calculator, you've got contour plot, clipping plane, slice plane, you know, various things that you can apply. And again, uh, I cannot extract subsets from this data because there are no subsets probably, right? I mean, it's grayed out, so I can't click on it. Um, Another place where you'll find the common filters are here, right? These are so common that they're given a sort of a desktop uh, view. So this is the, the icon for the, uh, for the contour filter. So we're gonna select that, okay? Um, okay, so uh, one thing to notice is that I've, I've selected this contour and it, it gets applied to whatever the, the, the highlighted element was uh, before I selected it. So what that means is I had, I had selected this, the data set, and then I, cl I clicked on contour and it added this contour filter, right? Okay, so we haven't applied the contour filter yet um, because we need to you know, click apply. And the reason is that we wanna have time to um, uh, set the filter up, right? To select the, um, the uh, uh, values that we want. Okay, so for example, um, remember that there were, I don't know, half a dozen variables in, in the data set. Which one are we contouring? You know, we want to be able to select that before we hit the go button. So here's the list of all the things that we can contour by. I'm going to, um, let's see, will the temperature? Yeah, I think I'll contour by temperature. And when I select temperature, you can see that here's the value range. Temperature goes from about 293 up to 913 degrees. Um, so what I'm going to want to do is select a temperature. And I'm going to select 400 degrees. That seems like a reasonable number. It's somewhere in that range. Then I'm going to click apply. Ha! Ah, look. There it is. What is it? 
this surface is the surface of the data uh, that we were looking at, the cylinder. Everywhere on this surface, the temperature is 400 degrees. Why is it multicolored? Because it's colored by the pressure. The pressure on this part of the surface is high, uh, relatively high, and the pressure over here is relatively low in the blue area. Uh, yet, this is the 400 degree contour, okay? Well, what happened to the data? The data went away because, um, uh, and the reason it, it disappeared was this, this contour was complete, would have been completely hidden by the data. So I can, I can click this little eye uh, icon to turn the data back on. Okay, so uh, now you see the isosurface is hidden. But uh, I can, since I have selected uh, this, um, oops, this, the, the input data, I can change the representation to over back over to wireframe, and that gives us a better idea of where that ISO surface is in relation to everything else, right? So that's where that ISO surface that we selected, uh, this is where it resides based on, I mean, in relation to the rest of the data, which is, which is pretty cool, okay? So that's interesting, all right. Uh, what else can we do? Um, so you notice these, uh, these arrows here allow us to orient the data however we like. If I select uh, this one, this one has, um, generates a view that's looking straight down the negative Z axis. So if you look over here in the corner, you see what the orientation of the X, Y, Z space is. X going to the right, Y goes up, and Z is pointing straight at us from the screen. Uh, and you can see that if I rotate a little bit, you can see Z move around. Um, that's the right-handed system that, that, uh, that we're given. Uh, so there, you can, do, you can uh, select uh, this view, or you can select uh, looking um, uh, down the positive Z axis, or you can select you know, any sort of orientation that you like. These all sort of look the same because they're, you know, looking down the X or Y axis, it's just the Z axis that, that uh, give you something different. So anyway, yeah, so that's pretty cool. So we've done some contour plotting, that's, that's great. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's do a different way of looking at things. Let's, Go back to surface for this guy, and let's, um, what should we do? Uh, let's extract a surface. That's another uh, interesting filter. So let's see filters. Here's, a, here's another trick with, um, that you can use with a pair of you. You can use the search tool, right? And I can say extract. Extract block? No, I want to extract. See, so this narrows it down for you. Uh, extract surface. There we go. That way you don't have to search through all of that good stuff. Okay. Or all of that. Uh, you don't have to search through that huge list of filters uh, when you're looking for one, provided you know what the name is. Um, okay, again, um, we're applying this filter because I had the data set selected. We're applying this filter to uh, the data set. Okay, so we haven't extracted anything yet. Let's look at the properties of this particular filter. So what are we going to do? We're going to, let's see, we're going to extract a surface. All those variables look good, so we're going to apply that. Okay, so it doesn't look like anything has changed, but what has actually changed is um, by extracting the surface, we've just pulled the surface mesh off of the three-dimensional mesh of the object, right? So now what, what's represented by, by um, this extract surface filter is just the surface mesh, right? So now we can, we can do something to this surface mesh. We can chop piece of it off. So we're gonna, we're gonna do what they call clipping, right? 
So let's uh, let's see. Is that the clip filter? Yes, it is. We'll select our clip filter from our from our list of usable filters here. So there's a filter, a clip filter. Let's clip in the Y direction and we'll clip off uh, the minus one direction of the normal and we'll apply that and and then we'll turn off the clipping plane. And you can see that it has clipped only the extract surface part of our uh, of our um, data, right? It didn't click. It didn't clip the contour because we didn't have the contour selected when we applied the filter. Okay, so this is another way of of getting a reference to um, where that uh, where that ISO surface is in relationship to the rest of the data, uh, the, the the round ISO surface compared to the rest of the cylinder. Um, another thing we can do is we can take a slice. Let's try slicing again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to select the, the data, the raw data itself. Uh, let's try a slice plane. Okay. That looks like as good a slice plane as any. Um, so I'm just, oh, okay. Uh, I should also go over, uh, let's just go ahead and apply that slice. Okay. Uh, and then I'll explain some other stuff. Okay, so we've gone ahead and sliced through the data. So we've passed a plane through the data, and we can see um, we can see the values on the plane. So it hasn't clipped away any of the data. It's just uh, done a sampling of a plane through um, through the data. And again, we have our slice highlighted. Uh, so we're we're uh, represented by a surface. Uh, we can do a surface with edges. Should we should we decide that's interesting? Ah, now we can see. Now you can see the internal finite element structure of the of the data, right? Oops, what have I done? I've just moved the surface. Okay, that's fine. Go ahead and apply that. So I moved the surface a little bit. I'll show you more about that in a minute. But anyway, the, you can see the detail of the internal of the internal grid when we do the surface with edges. We can also change uh, the uh, the rendering. We can render by temperature. Uh, we can render it by I don't know H two. What's H two? Hmm, not very interesting. I guess pressure is the most interesting thing. Uh, anyway, um, so you see this. You can see the see the red box and the uh, the vector here. We can we can change that and manipulate the slice plane however we like to take a slice at a different in a different direction or a different angle through the data, right? So we can orient the slice plane however we like to slice slice through the data. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, let's see uh, what's left. Uh, I noticed um, I noticed we had. We look at the data. I noticed we had uh, v for velocity. I think so. I think there is there is uh, velocity uh, data in here. So let's let's turn off the slice and the clip. Turn the yeah. Let's leave that for now. Um, well, better yet, let's do this. Let's turn that on. Turn off the contour and do a um, wireframe representation of that. So let's do let's add um, streamlines to the vector, right? Stream tracer. We'll add the stream tracer. Uh, and uh, so here are the properties for the stream tracer, which we're applying again to this to the disk data. How are we doing on time? Oh, pretty good. We have plenty of time, right? Um, Let's see. Okay, so what this is going to do is it's going to trace streamlines based on the vector uh, data that's inside of the velocity data that's inside this data set, apparently, right? So let's see. What? How can we set this up? We're gonna we're gonna use 
So in order to do this, we have to select a uh, place to start the um, uh, points to start the uh, to start the streamlines at, and we've selected um, here. We've selected uh, a high resolution line source, so that's that white line that you see. We can also pick a point source if we like, uh, but I think we'll go with the line because that'll generate a bunch of uh, a bunch of streamlines, and that you know a bunch of streamlines is sometimes more interesting to look at than just one. Uh, we're going to have a line, a line, line up with the, with the y-axis. So you can see here the line uh, goes right through the center of the data, and it's aligned with the, with the y-axis, and it goes right through that face of the base of that, um, that uh, cone or that indentation there. It wasn't a cone, right? Uh, let's say, well, let's go ahead and apply and see what happens. Apply. Whoa! Wow. Okay. So there's there's some there's some lines there, and I think there might be altogether too many. Let's get rid of the. Let's turn off the the look at the the uh, data set itself, and now we're just looking at the streamlines. So okay, yeah. There's a whole bunch of those there. You can see them uh, much better now, but yeah, I think there's a few too many. So let's. Let's see, uh, can we reduce the number? Ah, here we go, resolution, a thousand. Okay, there's a thousand streamlines in there. Let's, let's cut that down by order of magnitude and just do 100. Ah, that's better, look at that. Those well, streamlines are sort of hard to see though, right? I mean, you know, you can see the, you can see they all emanate from, the, uh, from that line and they're being traced forward and backward in time. And one other interesting bit is they're being colored by pressure. So the, the red parts are in, in a high pressure zone and the, and the blue parts are in a low pressure zone. They are a little bit hard to see. So what I'm gonna do is add another filter. Um, and I'm gonna use the search thing. And I'm gonna search for tube filter. And what the tube filter is going to do is it's going to take each one of those streamlines and put a tube around it so it gives it a little thickness. And I'm just going to apply it and see what happens. Whoa, those are way too big. Uh, we can, let's see, uh, we can change that uh, radius factor. There we go. Let's, let's try one and see what happens. Yes? No? I thought I changed the radius factor and applied. I guess not. Okay, well. Ah, here we go. The radius itself. Okay, there we go. Let's 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 shrink down the radius of those tubes. Ah, much more pleasing. So there you go. You can see this is this is where uh, whatever is traversing this uh, this domain. Is, is doing it in this, this interesting swirling fountain-like pattern with a, an interesting vertical sort of structure that goes right up through the center. And that's pretty cool. Anyway, uh, that, that gives you a, a sort of an introduction of, of some of the sorts of things that you can do with Paraview. Um, Paraview, comes with a bunch of sample data. There are, there are uh, tutorials out on the web also of um, what you can do with, with uh, Paraview. Ah, one other thing I wanted to show you is, here's an interesting um, thing. So, uh, so here we go, we've done all this work uh, in exploring this data, um, and we don't wanna construct it all. You know, we've got a whole bunch of filters that we can turn on and off. Let's turn the contour on and see. Oh yeah, look at that. That's kinda cool. We can also, let's see if we can, we've selected the uh, contour, let's, ah, here we go. We can change the opacity of the contour so that we can see through it. All right, it's still there, but now we can, now it's transparent and you can see the internal structure of those streamlines that are going on inside, okay. All right, so we've done a lot of work 
put this whole thing together and what we want to do is be able to come back at a later time uh, and, 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 and take over right where we left off, right? So it's time for lunch. We want to, we want to, uh, we want to make, a, uh, make a, a benchmark or a checkpoint, right? So the way you do that is we come over here and we say save state. And then what's going to happen is we, um, we want to save state. And what, what's going to happen is we're going to uh, be prompted for a file name. So you just uh, type in whatever file you like. Um, I, I've already done this once, but I like this state better. So I'm going to select uh, this PBSM file, which is a Pairview state uh, manager file. And I'm going to uh, select that, and if I click OK, uh, it's going to say, do you really want to replace it? Yes, I do. OK, I've done that. OK, so I've just saved my, ent my entire state. So when you want to come back, let me uh, reset my session. OK, everything's gone. So now I want to go back to where I was before. So I'll go to File, Load State, and I'm in the wrong thing. Uh, desktop, maybe. Where'd it go? Ah, there it is. It's right there. That one. And it's going to ask you to verify that these input files are uh, correct. So if you've moved the file somewhere, um, uh, ah, there it worked. Look at that. If you've moved the file, if you've moved your data file somewhere else, it gives you an opportunity to reset that and say, yeah, yeah, well, it used to be here, but now it's, now the data file is actually over here. So anyway, um, that's the, that's the quick and dirty uh, explanation of how Paraview works. Um, uh, that's, and that's, that's pretty much all I've got to say about that, as, as Forrest Gump would say. Um, any, um, any questions? If any questions, feel free to hit us up on the chat. Uh, also in the chat, I've posted a link to our Design Safe Slack team and the webinar Slack channel that you guys can ask questions to, so we'll leave it open. But everything that Dave did today, uh, we will have those available in the community data set or the community data folder in uh, Design Safe, so you guys can download it and, and mess with it yourself. And as Dave said, Paraview is available on Design Safe, so you don't need to actually download the software itself. Even though the software is uh, the software is open open source, you don't need to actually download it. You can run it directly off Paraview. So, uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to hit us up on uh, the chat channel here. As soon as the Zoom windows the Zoom sessions open uh, over, we can take the conversation to Slack. Uh, also. Uh, this recording that we record the webinar and all of our slides and stuff, and those will be available on uh, tax uh, training archive. So. Yeah, I just want to say um, I'm I'm a consultant here at TAC. If you're doing if you're doing work with Exceed or or uh, or any using any sort of uh, TAC resource, or um, you know if you're a university student, whatever, uh, you can. Um, uh, Put in a ticket for help with visualization stuff, and I'd be happy happy to help you uh, do more stuff with Visit or with Paraview or um, or some other package that I may not even know about. So um, that's my gig to uh, to do consulting. So use your resources. Great. If anybody has any questions, we'll be available for you. Uh, thank you so much for attending. All the attendees, you'll get a uh, you'll get a a link to a yeah I'm, I'm muted on my machine. Uh, you'll get a link to a a survey. I were gonna ask you some simple questions of what you thought about our, our webinar series. And once again, thank you very much. This is the last webinar of Design Safe. Uh, we will start up again in August. All right, you guys have a great night or a great afternoon. Thank you very much for attending. Thanks a lot. <laughs>